Hello, my name is Kyle Thomas with the Armchair Historian. In this three-part miniseries, I will be introducing you to the history of the Achaemenid Persian Empire, best remembered in the West as the adversary of the Greeks in the Greco-Persian Wars. The Persian Empire was one of the largest and most successful empires in ancient history. The military successes and, somewhat more famously, military defeats of the Persian Empire are important, but their administrative achievements are far more fascinating. The Persians pioneered institutions that would become essential to empires in Europe and West Asia for centuries including a sophisticated and efficient bureaucracy, a professional army, and advanced infrastructure such as road networks, a postal service, and an official language. In many ways, the Persian Empire was far ahead of its time, and it provides a fascinating example of a massive, diverse, multi-ethnic empire that managed to not only survive, but thrive for over 200 years. In this series, I will provide a broad overview of the history, culture, and administrative structure of the Persian Empire, from its founding in 550 BCE to its fall in 330 BCE at the hands of Alexander the Great. In this video, I will go over the major events in the history of the empire and the Achaemenid dynasty. In part two, I will discuss one of the Achaemenid's most effective empire-building strategies in detail. And in part three, I'll discuss the sources we have about the Persian Empire, how we know what we know, and why the historical narrative has tended to downplay or ignore their achievements. The Achaemenid dynasty was founded, according to Persian tradition, by Achaemenes, who ruled over a small kingdom in the Persis region of southwest Iran. Very little is known about Achaemenes, to the extent that historians aren't really sure if he was even real. It's possible that Achaemenes could be a mythical ancestor, created for a politically motivated founding myth, much like the mythical Roman founder Romulus. We'll discuss more about that later. We also know very little about this old kingdom in Persis. What you're seeing is the approximate region it probably encompassed, but we can't be sure. We get into more certain historical footing around 553 BCE. The Achaemenid Kingdom was at that time a part of the larger Median Empire, which had formed from the ashes of the Neo-Assyrian Empire around 609. The Achaemenid King at the time was Cyrus II, later to be known as Cyrus the Great. What was so great about him? Well, he rebelled against the Median Empire and beat them so badly he went on to conquer the whole thing. It was then, in 550 BCE, that the Persian Empire was formed. Seeing this revolution against the Medes as an opportunity, the neighboring kingdom of Lydia decided to invade what had been Median territory in Asia Minor. Cyrus responded by pushing out the invaders and then conquering all of Lydia leaving the Persian Empire in control of Anatolia by 546. Now, Cyrus spent the next six years putting down rebellions from former Median tributaries, and then in 540, he went to war with the Neo-Babylonian Empire. The Babylonians were conquered within a year, and Cyrus declared himself the rightful ruler of the Babylonian Empire. He based this claim on his assertion that the former king he had defeated, Nabonidus, had turned away from Babylon's traditional patron god, thus delegitimizing his rule. Now, interesting side note, part of Babylon's territory included the city of Jerusalem, whose people had been exiled from their homeland under the Babylonian Empire. Cyrus allowed the Hebrews to return and rebuild much of Jerusalem, including the Second Temple. In recognition of these deeds, Cyrus is actually praised as a messiah in the Hebrew Bible. Nine years later, Cyrus the Great died. Ancient accounts somewhat disagree on how he died, but most have him being killed in battle against some opponent in the northeast, possibly nomadic tribes from Central Asia. He was succeeded by his son, Cambyses II. Cambyses quickly conquered Cyprus, 
and he set about preparing to invade Egypt, which he accomplished in 525 after the reigning pharaoh Amesis II died, prompting several Egyptian allies to join the Persians. After Egypt fell, the African kingdom of Libya submitted willingly to Cambyses. The emperor then launched a campaign against the Ethiopians to the south, in order to further strengthen Persia's position in Africa. Now, Herodotus claims this expedition was a failure, but there is some archaeological evidence to suggest that Cambyses might have met with some success? It's kind of unclear. His success was short-lived, however, as a rebellion began in Persia in 522 BCE. Cambyses' half-brother Bardia, or possibly an official impersonating Bardia, depending on who you read, performed a coup and took the throne from Cambyses in his absence. Cambyses rushed to respond, but took a wound to the thigh along the way, which became infected. He died in Syria that same year, and Bardia became emperor. He ruled for only seven months before being overthrown by Darius I, Cambyses' cousin. It was Darius who first wrote about Achaemenes and the genealogy of the Achaemenid dynasty, leading some scholars to assume that Achaemenes and his family tree were invented by Darius to support his claim to the throne. Whatever the truth of his legitimacy, Darius, also known as Darius the Great, if that tells you anything, proved to be an effective ruler. He carried out several administrative reforms, he constructed the grand capital city of Persepolis, and he waged wars of conquest which expanded the empire in all directions. The Persian Empire reached its greatest territorial extent under Darius, covering over 3.1 million square miles. Now this height would be maintained, under relative stability, until 499 BCE, when several Ionian Greek cities in western Anatolia rebelled against Persian rule. The city-state of Athens supported the rebels, and after the rebellion was crushed in 493 BCE, Darius set out to punish the Athenians for their interference. And now it's time for the Greco-Persian Wars! Darius sent an army to invade Athens, and it met the Athenian forces on the fields of Marathon, northeast of Athens. The Greeks won a surprising victory there, forcing the Persian army to withdraw, thus ending the first of the so-called Greco-Persian Wars. Darius immediately began planning another expedition into Greece, but his declining health and a revolt in Egypt delayed these plans. Five years later, in 485, Darius died and was succeeded by his son, Xerxes I. Xerxes followed up on his father's plans and invaded Greece in 480, crossing the Hellespont and attacking from the north. His army was briefly delayed at Thermopylae, but otherwise he met little resistance as he marched south. The Persians sacked the evacuated city of Athens, but the bulk of their army was forced to withdraw after their fleet was soundly defeated at the Battle of Salamis, and Xerxes worried that the fleet would go on to destroy the bridges he'd created over the Hellespont Strait. Some Persian forces did remain in Greece, until 479, when they were defeated at Plataea and Mycale. These defeats drove the Persians firmly out of Greece and allowed Macedonia to break free from Persian control. After the Greco-Persian Wars, the Persian Empire lost all of its territories in Europe, and its expansion ceased. Xerxes I was assassinated in 465 BCE, and his son Artaxerxes I succeeded him. Artaxerxes introduced a number of reforms in the empire, including a national calendar and a new national language. Now, Artaxerxes carried out a sort of cold war with the Athenians, funding their enemies in Greece and offering asylum to Themistocles, the Athenian general who had led the Greek forces at Salamis after the Athenians exiled him. Hostilities were officially ended in 449 with the Peace of Callias. Artaxerxes died of natural causes in 424, and a succession crisis immediately followed, in which three emperors ruled within the span of a year. Each assassinated his predecessor, until the third usurper, Darius II, managed to secure his position. Now, not a lot is known about this Darius's reign. 
except that he resumed Persian meddling in Greece in 412 BCE by funding the Spartans, who were fighting the Athenians in the Peloponnesian War. Darius II died of illness in 404, and was succeeded by his son Artaxerxes II. Soon after his coronation, Artaxerxes' younger brother Cyrus began a civil war to claim the throne. During the chaos of this conflict, a revolution broke out in Egypt, and successfully restored Egyptian independence from the Persians. Artaxerxes II defeated his brother, and went on to rule for 45 years, the longest reign of any Persian emperor. He expanded the capital at Persepolis, and decked out the summer capital of Ecbatana with some extraordinary bling, including gilded columns and roof tiles made of silver and copper. He also ordered the construction or restoration of several monuments, including the massive palace of Darius the Great at Susa, and his own magnificent tomb, which was constructed during his life as per Persian custom, which includes a large carved relief of the emperor, supported by soldiers representing all of the diverse ethnicities which made up the Persian Empire. Artaxerxes II and his successor, Artaxerxes III, were involved in several minor conflicts with different Greek city-states between 396 and 343. Artaxerxes III ultimately made peace with the Greeks in 343 and turned his attention toward reconquering Egypt. Artaxerxes II had tried to reclaim Egypt during his reign, but his son managed to seal the deal and reclaim the valuable region within the year of 343. Egypt remained part of the empire until it was conquered by Alexander a decade later. After Egypt was reconquered, the Persian Empire enjoyed a stable and prosperous decade, largely free of internal strife. Many of the Aegean islands were reclaimed from a drastically weakened Athens, and little attention was given to the ambitions of Philip II, king of Macedon, who wanted to unite Greece and launch an invasion of the Persian Empire. Artaxerxes III and his son Artaxerxes IV, creative bunch that Artaxerxes family, were both poisoned by the ambitious vizier Begoas in 336 BC. Begoas placed a nephew of Artaxerxes IV called Darius III on the throne. Now, if Begoas thought that Darius would be grateful enough for the throne to forgive the whole poisoning his uncle thing, he would be disappointed. Darius forced Begoas to swallow poison shortly after taking the throne. Soon after, another rebellion broke out in Egypt, which Darius successfully crushed in 334. With the bulk of his forces in Egypt, Darius was unable to stop the threat that came from the west. Alexander, son of Philip II and king of Macedonia, invaded the Persian Empire. With victory after victory, Alexander the Great conquered the empire rapidly, capturing Persepolis in 330. Alexander was a great admirer of Cyrus the Great, and paused in his conquest to visit the tomb of Cyrus and order its restoration. Taking a page from Cyrus's playbook, Alexander went to great lengths to legitimize himself as the rightful successor to the Achaemenid dynasty. He kept intact the Achaemenids' administrative structure and bureaucracy, and publicly adopted many Persian customs and trappings of power. Because of these efforts to style himself as the newest in the line of Persian emperors, some scholars call Alexander the last of the Achaemenids. After Alexander's death, his empire was divided among his generals, and the Achaemenid Persian Empire came to an end. The 220-year reign of the Achaemenids was exceptional for the relative stability and prosperity they enjoyed throughout. There were few major rebellions, only one, admittedly quite serious, external invasion, and a single ruling dynasty that remained in power throughout the empire's life. In part two, I'll discuss one of the key ruling strategies of the Persian Empire, and how it contributed to the empire's remarkable stability. For now, thank you for watching. I'm Kyle Thomas with the Armchair Historian.